We are in this interesting challenge yeah. where the net is going into the winter of the climb. We have to take a look at, we really have to, so with biotech, nanotech and a variety of other things, hopefully driving growth from 2020, 2025 onwards, we've got an interesting decade ahead. A decade where your jobs will be destroyed. Take my <coughs> word for it. What strategic insight can you harness in order to create a new order of things? That is the challenge. And that's what we're going to talk about. Right, Africa. So first, before we hit Africa, let's take a look at some of the primary forces that change this space. There are three primary forces that challenges the ecosystem of the ICT space. That is processing power, bandwidth, and storage space. What is interesting about these three forces is that they double approximately every two years. Bandwidth a bit faster, about every 14 months. Storage space about every 16 months. Empirically, we're seeing processing power doubling every two years, not 18 months. But what is interesting is take a look at any other industry out there. Take a look at the automotive industry. Take a look at the airline industry. All of those industries, if they're lucky, they have a 4 or 5% improvement year on year. Right? In the underlying assets or technology, we drive their business model. So if my F airline is 3 or 4% more fuel efficient than last year, I'm happy. If my car is 3 or 4% more efficient than last year, I'm happy. And, our, and the business models are centered around those slow changes. The fact of the matter is, in the ICT game, the underlying assets on which you base your business model is dramatically changing in a two-year basis. Now, you have to understand that the competition between them in different geographical reason, regions will also change. So if bandwidth is faster than processing power, that means that bandwidth becomes abundant and, and processing power becomes scarce in comparison. So with processing power, empirically every 24 months, we're moving into the second part of the chessboard. If we take a look at the increase in processing power in 1980, uh, let's say processing power was equal to 1,000 for the same monetary unit, for the same monetary unit 30 years later, you could get 200 million cycles. If we take a look at bandwidth, which empirically is uh, growing every 15 months, we are seeing massive increases in fiber optic speeds. You can send more information in a second over a fiber optic cable that was sent over the entire internet in a month in 2000. I'm going to repeat that. You can send more information in a single second over a fiber optic cable now than was sent over the entire internet in a month in the year 2000. That's the increase in fiber optic speeds. And we're not only seeing an increase in fiber optic speed, but in wireless speeds as well. So what we're seeing is wired communication speed, massive increase from 1950 <coughs> onwards. We're also seeing wireless speeds, although the cost has really fallen. But in 1980, wireless bandwidth, a unit price of one, would be equal to a million 30 years later. That's the increase in abundance. So what's really interesting is that storeworth is doubling, the combination of storage space and bandwidth. And we are seeing massive prediction. Next year, we are, we are seeing um, one zettabyte of volume flowing through the net, or that is equal to a stack of books from here to Pluto times 20. That was when Pluto was still a planet. Now it's just a planetoid or something. <laughs> anyway, massive speed. We, I was sitting around a, a, a chat room and listening in on a conversation, and Rob, Rob Reed, uh, founder of Listen.com, way back, he said, by the end of this decade, which will be in 2010, you'll have enough storage space on your home computer, about six terabytes, to store the entire music library of the population up to this point in time. So the entire world's music library, you'll be able to store in your home computer. Imagine you want to impress the chicks on that one. Huh? I've got the entire world's music. Wow. It's going to take you about 400 years to listen to all this. I've got it at my home, on my computer. At that point, we'll reach the point of lunacy, he said. So can you remember the 7th of August, 2009? Who remembers the 7th of August, 2009? Because that's the day where you could really buy a six terabyte drive for a relatively cheap price, I think for about 300, 3,000 rand. Now for about 1,000 you can get it. So at that point, you could store the entire music library on your home computer. No one even noticed. Abundance just came in, and we didn't even the notice it. The music also increased. The number of music available now is 
What? Not even close to the terabyte you can play with, man. Yeah, no, but then you've got compression tools to even make it smaller so you can fit more. Okay. You can see how we've got, got a bunch of techies in the room. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the important thing to realize is that these underlying forces happen under our very noses and we are barely aware of them. Well, I want to make you aware of the fact is how this will change your industry in the years to come. We will get into an environment. Right now, storage space is more abundant than bandwidth in South Africa. That's why your set-top boxes allows you to record the TV programs from it. And um, in America, Disney thought they were there in 2004 with a movie bean box. What happened to the movie bean box? Movie bean box, what the hell is it? It never even materialized because bandwidth was faster. Right now at my house, I watch Hulu Plus and Netflix. Have you heard of Hulu, Hulu Plus and Netflix? Come on, people. You're in the industry. Do not give me that. Do not give me that. Do you know, do you know what Netflixing means? It's a verb. Now, who, watch, uh, who watched uh, House of Cards? Or Game of, House of Cards, right? Mm -hmm. With Kevin Spacey. Who watched it? House of Cards on DSTV. It's one of the best political series out there. Are you guys dead or what? <laughs> well, what do you do over weekends? Watch sport? No, we don't. Drink? I don't watch sport. Just space out. <laughs> do you guys watch it? Yeah. House of Cards. That's Brilliant. I mean, look at, look at the, the guys from, the, from okay. America. They know what I'm talking about. One of the best political dramas out there. And they had a first series that ended, I think, in February here in South Africa. The a week later, they brought out the next series on Netflix. But they brought, bring out the entire series at, at the same time. So you don't have to wait an entire week to watch it. So what you normally do, and that's what Netflixing is called. You put on your pajamas, you lock your doors, and you sit down and you watch the entire series in one sitting. It's like 13 hours. It's called Netflixing. I'm sorry I can't come to your bra right now. I'm Netflixing. I'm sorry, my daughter can't come to your. Uh, I'm sorry, my daughter can, can't come to your uh, birthday. Uh, we're Netflixing. You get the idea? So it means you decide when you want to watch it. And guess how much I pay for my Netflix? Eight. Uh, I'm a whole subscriber. Eight dollars a month, and you watch anything at any point in time, whenever you want. I think close to about ten or fifteen percent of movies is on Netflix. So you can just click a button and you stream it. I've got a four megabit per second line, more than, more than enough, and I watch Netflix. That's changing the ball game. Now, we have stopped our DSTV subscription. Within the next year, the operators will roll out fiber to the curb, and we will see an explosion in fiber access in the larger metropolitan areas around the country. What's going to happen to your DSTV boxes you do? It's going to disappear. Yeah. The only content they have, the only reason why people want them is sport, because that's live. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't do sport in any other way. And the amount of rip will be there. I'll just put on my well, Skype cam, which then stream it via Skype, and people can watch it. And I'll say, oh, I don't want to go down that route. But the fact is, the only reason why DSTV has got subscribers is uh, Survivor and Super Sport. That's it. And all of the other shows is available on Netflix, and there is no more TV channels left. What will that do to your business? In America, there is no set-top box that records movies. Everything is streamed because bandwidth has become more abundant than storage space. In South Africa, that shift is going to happen in the next two years. How would you react? You don't know yet. You didn't even know your, co your company is going to close down in three years. Here's a heads up. And it's going to be replaced by Roku or a TV or, or Apple TV or a, or a built-in service. So this, what I'm telling you, is not little stories. It's not the five-minute stories to keep you guys entertained. We are talking about a sea change every two, three years in the business models that drive the world. And because of the abundance of bandwidth, you will see that your business model no longer holds water. Yes, there is markets in Africa that will still use it because they're the opposite reverts. And if you don't have access to a fiber, it's there. But expect a 20, 30, 40% drop in um, volumes over the next couple of years if you continue targeting the same market. You need to take a look at other markets. We'll talk about Africa in a moment. Okay, so the, the space is really an interesting one.
century. This is an old IBM clip. Sorry. Uh, this but... is it. This is this way. This way. What happened? Everything happened. I, I, I called you as soon as I could. Tell us what I'm trying to get calm, but everything is gone. You want me to be calm? Is, 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 is it possible that it's an inside job? Wait, I mean, we're inside, yeah. right? Yeah. You've got to be pros, these guys. Calm down, sir, and tell us what happened. I can't happened. breathe. I need my pills. This way. The room's completely empty. What was stolen? Everything. 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 Payroll, R&D, customer records. Assets. All of the assets. How could they get everything? How do I know? You're the cops. I'd say, look, pal, we're the only friends you've got. How much money are we talking? A lot. Millions. 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 All the Millions. assets were in this room? Ned, the servers. They stole all our servers. No, we moved everything onto that one. It's going to save us a bundle. I sent out an email. IBM servers running Linux. What's a server? Good infrastructure. It can save you a bundle. And Mike will tell you that HP servers can do it better and faster. So this is where and it's a 10 year old clip because everything's moving to the cloud anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah, <laughs> so, the interesting thing here is that bandwidth processing found storage space is creating a world of abundance. And this world of abundance is changing the very foundations of the business models around us. The fact of the matter is that we're moving into the second part of the chessboard. We're now getting doubling of bandwidth storage space and it is changing the very fabric of technology companies and in essence of society. <coughs> What's interesting to note is that if you want to make money in this world, you cannot act as if it's scarce. You need to exploit the abundance. Now a lot of people come up and say, what do you mean exploit the abundance? I mean, explain the model to me. And the movie Beanbox is actually a very good model to explain it. Because when in 2004 it came out in, um, in America, the idea was that you have, would have 200 movies and that you would watch the movie by simply clicking a button, similar to our PVR devices right now. Gets transmitted via satellite, you have it on your device, you click a button and you watch it. You have all of these movies on this box, but you know that you're really not going to watch all of them. So let's be kind and say that you, let's say you watch 100 of them. So the company goes through all the trouble to download all the movies on their device and you, and you can watch them at the click of a button, but they only get revenue if you choose to watch one of them. So look at this massive amount of wasted storage space. Add it up, would you? 100 million boxes times 4.7 gigabytes times 100 movies that you don't watch being chip flicks. That's more storage space than existed on the entire planet in 1990, now being used to store chip flicks that no one wants to watch. What a waste of storage space. But who cares? Because storage space is in abundance. Do you see the model? Exploit the abundance because now you create value. And take a look at what it did to DVD stores. Closing down left, right and center. And in two years time, you're going to close down the DSTV branch if they're, if they're, not, if they're not careful. Because what we're seeing is a change in the way we consume media. It's all about exploiting the abundance. Let's exploit bandwidth because bandwidth is in abundance. So. This is what's happening from a strategic perspective. You see, in the mid-1990s, even, even as late as 2005, the digital value chain looked as follows. We had hardware, and this hardware could be a set-top box, or hardware could be a, a point-of-sale system. On top of it, there's an operating system. There's a local loop that connects you to the internet. So this might be your GSM, 2G, 3G, 4G technology. It could be Wi-Fi, it could be ADSL, it could be satellite. There is a backhaul capability if it's a base station, so it centralizes it and takes it onto the net, where inside the network you have intelligent edge, identification and billing and the switch. If it was a telephone call, they would switch you out and let you talk to the other person on the other end. If you have access to content, you will go through the internet to a portal where a service aggregator will give you access to either content or services. Now that was the traditional model. The power in that value chain resided in the middle of that network. That was the, the world of the intelligent network, or the mindset was still there. We had dumb instruments at the edges, and the intelligence was centered around in the middle. Because bandwidth was scarce, we used processing power, which at that point in time was more abundant than bandwidth, to allocate which individuals would use the scarce bandwidth as we would switch them together. You'd have a telephone number, it wouldn't be live, it only goes live if the circuit is open and you can talk to someone else. What started happening subsequently, is that in 1998, you have to read that article, The Future of the Stupid Network, although it was 14 years ago. Um, don't worry, we'll, we'll cover the 20 laws of the telecosm in your work manuals. We'll, we'll cover that as well. But in essence, what started happening is that intelligence started to explode as well as bandwidth. And because bandwidth 
was exploding in the middle, it meant that any electronics you put in the middle of the network actually slowed the packets down. So by ripping out all of the stuff in the middle of the network, you actually would make the packets flow faster. And that's in essence what started happening. But processing power also meant that intelligence started moving towards the edge of the network. And as intelligence started moving to the edge of the network and the networks became dumb, so did the identification, which was critical, the power and the profit. So from 2005, 2006 onwards, who actually started controlling this value chain? Not only did new companies start to control the value chain, the operators lost out big time. Their ideas of value-added services flew out the window. They couldn't keep up. And what started happening is that the structure of the value chain started to change. We started seeing that the identification now were no longer required, although they still do it. There was no longer prerequisite to have it here, and it started appearing on top of your operating system. So the only part of your mobile phone which the network owns is the SIM card. That's your identification. But I can plug in any SIM card in a moment's notice from another network, and I can still use all the functions, which means that the network is a dumb pipe. What started happening is that the identification becomes soft switch gate. That identification means that I can use your phone and within 20 seconds I can link up and put my Skype ID and my Gmail ID in there and I can communicate to the world via your device. Identification started sitting on top of the operating system. So we started having apps running on top of the operating system with identification becoming a key part of it. On the device, and we started seeing that billing became part of the aggregate at the end. So if you download an app from Google or from Apple, the networks doesn't even know about it. So what we started seeing is that all the power and the profit started to migrate to the edges. With the more than one billion apps that were out there, what percentage of them were written by operators? Not comma, not one percent? So the operators completely lost out of that game, and although some of them still have an inflated sense of self-importance, this is changing. It means that the network is becoming a dump pipe and, and that means that the cheapest way of getting information from one place to another is there. With the move towards fourth generation technology, we are seeing a massive impact on the pricing regime and business models of operators. We will go into a world of bandwidth abundance where we can no longer act as if it's scarce and charge people a lot, a lot of money for the use of that infrastructure the business model must change. So the LT guys, watch out for the space. Massive changes coming in your business model as well. Not only the set-top boxes, you guys also have to start worrying about and update your CVs or looking at some new opportunities in the market. <laughs> so a massive change in the power within the value chain. And in a way, the net heads started kicking out the bell heads. Yes, there's still room for the bell heads, as Mike will tell you, big debates about uh, network neutrality. Do you know the term network neutrality? Net neutrality? Come on! Even Moby was running up and down talking about network neutrality. Moby? Oh boy. Gee. Okay. Network neutrality in, a, in essence says that the network operator cannot distinguish between packets, IP packets, or the content of the IP packets running over their networks. So that they have to give equal um, equal usage rights. <laughs> or equal access to IP packets running on their network. Then the, the telecom networks say, you know what? If we can only make money from data, we're dead. So can't we just charge more for video? Or can't we charge a bit more for voice? Or can't we charge a bit more for, for um, video conferencing? And the whole idea of network operators about quality. Now, I'm going to do a session on the battle between the netheads and the bellheads, and I'm going to contrast these two philosophies, but that will happen later. I just want to make you aware of the fact that this <coughs> is changing the mindset. In the past, if someone had an app, they would ask, does it work on all networks? No one asked that anymore. They now ask, does it work on all handsets? Or in essence, on all operating systems? The power have moved from the center of the network to the edges. And this exact slide I have shown 14 years ago to Alan Ott Craig at Vodacom. So this is nothing new. We knew of this way back. Nothing new. But did the operators take heed? Nope. Completely clueless. They had the opportunity to invest in value-added services that would go and that would become apparent in a world after bandwidth abundance. Didn't do so. Now they're grasping at straws. Internet of things, intelligent cities, because their main revenue stream is declining year on year. Hee-haw. They still will make money, just far less. Okay, 
That's really what it's about. Law number three of the telecosm. You've got the 20 laws of the telecosm. We'll talk about it. But this means that networks will become black boxes, dump pipes with intelligence spread to the machines at the peripheries. It means one thing for the corporates in terms of redefining your business model. It means another thing for VC. It means that you can create tremendous amount of value by th having three guys writing an app and having a worldwide distribution system because everyone is running, has got a supercomputer in their pockets with an operating system where you can distribute it to. If you've got a powerful enough meme, you don't even have to worry about marketing or advertising. Remember, advertising is the cost of being boring. We'll talk about that later. Right. So what Mike and Rowan will be talking about is Mike will talk about the business models and the opportunities that large corporates will have in this space. And our other distinguished guest, Roman, will talk about the opportunities that happens here. What is driving VC? What are the new ways in which we can provide services by creating new ways of doing things? And how to harness this new interconnected space? So after tea, I'm going to give a hand over to them and they're going to give you some ideas. Right. So, what is important to understand is where this world of ubiquity is going to. So this world we call ubiquitous internet. Where is it? I've heard of this thing called the internet. Where is it, by the way? Huh? Any idea? In the cloud. The internet in the cloud? Up there. Those things. <laughs> where is it? Where's this thing called the internet? You don't know either? We've got a problem. Where is the internet, guys? Everywhere. Right. It's right here, in front of my nose. Because from the spot right here, I can connect to the internet via 11 different ways. You want me to count them for you? GSM data, GPRS, Edge, RK, I'm fooling a bit, but what the hell. 3G data, HSUPA, LTE, CDMA 2000, are you guys from Neotel, iBurst? Um, TD, UMTS, oh, they switched that out, so I can't use that anymore. That's an old centric one. Um, they might have Wi-Fi. Maybe our old WiMAX tower running up and down. And we even have VSAT going to the satellite. Oh, and that doesn't even talk about the new technology that Google is running out. White space, IEEE, uh, 802.20 and 802.22 technologies, or even the mesh Wi-Fi networks. You see, from this spot, I can connect to the internet around me. I just don't know it's here. The interesting fact of the matter is that over the last 10 years, reality as we see it, as we touch it, and the world of the internet have already merged. We just didn't realize. The world already merged. The internet is everywhere. The next big challenge is where we start becoming aware of that fact. Where we start contextualizing it and having access to information from the spot and making money out of it. Unfortunately, we don't see these frequencies. You see, as humans, we can only hear some frequencies from about 20 hertz to about 15 kilohertz. That's what we can hear. Females can go high and go up to 17 kilohertz. Dogs even higher to 21. My, my wife, when she starts really getting agitated with me, this pitch of her voice goes higher. And then at a certain point, I, I just can't hear what you're saying anymore. I see her lips are moving, but that's about it. <laughs> Honey, I know you're mad at me, but I really can't hear anything. As I grow, as I grow older, you know, that, that frequency goes down as well. So really, it's, it's scientifically proven. What's called bills on the clock. There you go, yeah. there you go. <laughs> uh, it's also interesting to know that we start, and then above 15 or 16 kilohertz, ah, forget it, we can't see it. We can't hear it, but it's here. These are the frequencies all around us. We just can't experience them as humans. Then we start seeing some frequencies from about 400 terahertz to about 780 terahertz, <coughs> 790 terahertz. We start seeing frequencies as different colors. Again, we as males are disadvantaged in that space. Females have got double the amount of cones at the back of their eyes than males have. So where males have got one color called pink, females have got about 11 colors. They've got carnation, strawberry, bubblegum, magenta, salmon, tangerine. So that's why men don't go into interior decorating. My wife normally comes up and says, so honey, which of the following three colors should we paint on the wall? I'm like, but they're all the same color. No, it's not. Don't be funny. I'm, I'm serious. It's just all the same bloody color. But nonetheless, um, so we are completely misunderstood as males. Um, I think we are the weaker sex, so please be kind to us. The fact of the matter is that we can't see these frequencies around us. But although the internet is all around us, there's also an interesting play. That everything around you will also get an internet address. Now for the last 10 years, you can even see, this was the original Audi TT, the Audi um, R8 design. You can see it's way back. So this slide is coming from the year 2000, really, I'm not kidding. 
And I start telling people, in the future, you will have a light that will have an internet address. And your microphone will have an internet address. And your PC will have five. And your camera will have one. And people looked at me all funny and said, a light having an internet address? Well, I've been saved. Because last year, Philips, as well as LG, brought out the first internet addressable light bulbs. Which you can now chat to and say, go, go dimmer, go softer, whatever. So the real interesting thing is that everything around us will get an internet address. Most cars have IPv6 MAC layer addresses. So you just plug in a unit and you can analyze the entire car. Your car will have more than a thousand IP addresses. So the fact is, if I said you will have 500 IP addresses in your future, I was lying. And it's all about IP version 6. You see, Stanford University got the same amount of IP addresses as the Republic of China. Now, they didn't like that, seeing that Stanford has got maybe 100,000 people and China had 1.2 billion people. So IP version 6, a very big push from the Chinese to try and get IP version 6 out there. And it is enough space. So for every human on the planet, there's 52,000 trillion trillion addresses available. Or for every 100 IP addresses for every atom on the surface of the planet, or in another case, 4.8 trillion addresses for every known star in the known universe. Interesting enough is that the, in the internet is pervasive, intelligent, and invisible. It's all around us, and it creates wonderful opportunities. This is the challenge. You see, the physical space and the internet have already merged into one. But now, when the mental space and our ability to understand our connection to the internet start merging, wonderful new business opportunities will emerge. The space is open. We are now living in one of the most entrepreneurial societies and environments ever in the mankind of history, where three guys can create an app and it can roll it out to the rest of the world. And we will have new wearable technology that will open up new opportunities. The fact of the matter is we are entering what we call the cybersphere. The cybersphere where the internet is all around us and we start acting and interacting with it and where everything becomes one. Take a look at your payment systems. How often do you use cash and how often do you use a card? Seeing the guys in the card space. So you take your card, you zap it through a, a reader, logs onto the internet, takes money out of your account, pops into the retailer's account, comes back and says trans transfers done. Our monetary system is already part of the internet. And that means that it will just continue further and further. The opportunities just means that as we have supercomputers in our pockets and our interaction with this invisible internet happens on a on a minute by minute basis, we are changing the way we think of the world and also the way we structure value in this world. And that is the cybersphere. So here's a little video clip to give you a possible insight into what it might look like.
Again, a video clip that was made seven years ago, believe it or not. And in the interim, every single thing you've seen has already happened. From holograms to in-building navigation. Uh, and Roman has got a brand new technology on in-building navigation, but I can't say too much about it. Maybe hopefully he will tell you about it. And it's got very little to do with Wi-Fi coordinates and Wi-Fi triangulation and GPS. Nonetheless, what is interesting to note is that we have interesting insights into how the world will change. I can't personally wait for in-building navigation in supermarkets. Seeing that you spend 80% of your time looking for stuff, especially if you're a male, you know, we just hate searching for things. If we can't find peanut butter in our own fridges, you know how frustrating it is searching for that inside the supermarket. It really provides a level of stress that it's very difficult to explain to a female. These are love gathering things. We just stress about it. How lovely it'll be if you have your little uh, recipe and you can walk up to the exact point where you can buy it and then the stress is far less. Then you only have this perimeter to search for things, which is difficult enough, but uh, at least we can cope. So the world of the cybersphere, an uh, interesting place that will change in a way, not our online behavior, but our daily behavior as the internet and the real life merge into one and new technologies change the way we communicate. How this will change Africa is interesting. Directly after this, I'll talk about um, when, when I'm on again this afternoon, I'll talk about the revolution in wireless communication, device convergence, and then I'll tell you about the new business models that will be similar to the mindset change we need. So I'll do that this afternoon. But I want to finish African context first, where we are, where we're heading. We will break for tea, and then we'll have Mike um, and Roman giving you some insights from their worlds. So Africa, briefly, is that if you think Africa is a small place compared to the rest of the world, think again. Africa, as it's here, includes China, India, the whole of Eastern Europe, and the United States, all in the same landmass as Africa. Africa is a big place. Don't underestimate it. If we take a look, however, at population throughout the world, we're seeing China sitting at about 1.3 billion people, India at 1.1, United States about 300,000. Interestingly enough, Indonesia also sitting on 300 million people here. So massive amount of population sitting here. They say if you take um, Manila being the highly congested space in terms of person, people per square kilometer in the Philippines. But the Brazil, 200 million people odd, Russia, but Africa, not really, except uh, perhaps Nigeria. Huge amount of people there. But in essence, that's the current status quo of the world population. So why the interest in Africa, really? Well, let's take a look at the population pyramids, or for lack of a better word, pyramids or the graphs. And if we take a look at a number of countries around the world, we're seeing some startling statistics. If we take a look at Italy, look at the larger growing population that's growing older. And with Italy, with the nanny state and with social security schemes, you at least need about four or five people working to pay for every pensioner. Because how are you going to look after people if there's no new revenue coming in? And these guys have major concerns because the amount of working people at work that pays taxes to look after pensioners simply isn't there in the near future. So what we are seeing is a growth in population until it reaches its maximum in 2020 and at that point it will start to decline. So we'll have a declining population in some countries. The same is happening in Japan. So we're seeing a population that grows older and there's simply no one else to, to pick up the slack and pay all those taxes. Fortunately, um, robots can pay union fees. If they change that to paying taxes as well, maybe there's a, a solution there. So if we can get robots to pay taxes, problem solved. Maybe Japan can show us a thing or two. You know that, that in, in, in Japan, the robots pay union fees. Interesting, useless factoid, whatever. Europe as a whole, we're seeing Europe as a whole in 2025 starting to decline reaching a maximum of 700 million people. And the United States, not really a decline, but more a, a pyramid, where <coughs> they grow um, consequently up to about 2100, reaching about 480 million people. So not really a decline in the US, <coughs> definitely a, um, a supportive element, but with their debt levels, 
on usdebtclock.org, really worrying what the debt is, but fortunately they can service their debt with low interest rates. Uh, China, interesting one, their one-child policy, having an impact on them, that's why they're changing that now to get more kids in here, because they might see some interesting population characteristics and interesting impacts on the economy going forward. And then our friends in Brazil, also growing, but reaching um, a epoch in 2040 or a maximum at 224 million people. So some of our trade partners in the BRICS group, India, interesting that India will surpass China in the next couple of decades and uh, we expect them to reach 1.7 billion people by 2065. Remember that, 1.7 billion people in one country. That's an unbelievable amount of people. And India is not that large, as you can see within the African context, quite small. So that brings us to South Africa. Right now, more than 50% of the population below the age of 18, and with very little jobs for them, really a bit of a concern. So what will this mean for the economy going forward? But 50% of our population below the age of 18. Born freeze, let's see what they will do in the next couple of decades. And reaching a maximum by 2070 with about 57 million people, not really that much, but that's the projected growth. What's really interesting, however, is what will happen in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is what it looks like. Look at the growth. We'll start seeing close to 3.3 billion people by 2100. We're currently sitting at about 850. Yeah, there we are. We will add another 150 million people between 2010 and 2020. Massive, massive growth in population. So within economies that adopt market-friendly policies with access to resources and with the help of our Chinese brothers, having access to railways and roads and so forth, where those uh, resources can be harnessed, we will start seeing secondary industries and um, specifically telecommunication capabilities spreading throughout the continent. After the um, one o'clock or after lunch, I'll talk about the revolution in wireless technology where Africa will be covered by high-speed wireless networks and where the abundance of smartphones, how that will open up new services that will create new opportunities, seeing that there isn't any barriers to entry as in developed economies. And we're also going to talk about the possibilities of new business models in developing economies where the adoption of mobile payments in, in Kenya with the MPSA system being the world first. Even in industrial economies like Europe, they're not using mobile phones for payment. The guys in Kenya have been doing that for the last eight years. So what we're seeing is that because of there's a lack of other services in the economy, we might see that mobile technology will replace and even leapfrog that because there is little barriers to entry and that the adoption of these technologies are more advantageous because we have this youthful population that embraces technology and will embrace it because it opens benefits to them that simply would not be available anywhere else. And the opportunities to leverage that is enormous. And that's going to be part and parcel of our discussion as well.